the National Executive Council and the National Executive Committee. I find it refreshing always when I remind myself of the profound statement by the eminent civil servant, it's an anamkwa or blessed memory to the effect that it is the perfection of the civil servant that will move this country forward, not the politician. Right to that point. <laughs> it is the perfection of the civil servant that has motivated the civil and local government staff of social and closer to call for measures that will promote professionalism, integrity, and collaboration in the civil service and the local government service. These services have been long hallowed institutions whose utility lies entirely in their presumed anonymity, neutrality, and permanence from one political administration to the next. The civil service and the local government service are expected to remain in place, functioning in a professional manner to ensure continuity and process integrity in the administration of the day-to-day -day governments. The impairment of the activities of the civil service and the local government service will affect the development of the country and turn the tide of progress and positive change. It is within this context that the Kamka of the use of the Presidential Office Act 1993. That is distressing at the effectiveness of the civil service and the local government service has been brought to the fore to serve as the table for the safe return and unquote and all the child by paying attention to our guest speaker and a lecture on the constitutionality of the Presidential Office Act 1993 and contributions from other dignitaries, I'm certain that we will be equipped with tools to call for an amendment of the Act of this application. The Presidential Office Act has impeded the growth and progress of the civil service and the local government service. The Act in its current form is a duplication of the functions of the civil service. Once again, you are welcome to this ceremony. I hope that you will all have an excited moment there. Thank you very much and God bless you. The Presidential Office Act at Force History and discuss whether the said act is constitutional or unconstitutional. It is important to set out the facts in the Corsa case in some detail. The analysis by the court and the core reasoned decisions of that court. It is only after such an analysis that we may be in a position to discuss whether the Presidential Office Act 1993, Act 463, is constitutional or not. It must, however, be noted that under Articles 21A and B and 131A and B of the Constitution 1992, it is only the Supreme Court that can declare an Act of Parliament as unconstitutional. So I may only give you hints. But can, I cannot, as I stand here, declare any act unconstitutional because I don't have that power again as a retired judge of the Supreme Court. The plaintiff COXA, what are the facts? The plaintiff COXA is a registered trade union and mouthpiece of workers in the civil and local government services. The Attorney General is the principal legal advisor to the government. In the same case, the court held that since the Attorney General is the pro forma defendant for all civil proceedings instituted against the state, the presence of the second and third defenders, i.e. Office of Head of Civil Service and Office of Head of Local Government Service in the suit was not necessary and accordingly struck them out as a necessary practice. Uh, on the issue of the Constitution, uh, Dr. Cassie rightly indicated, because I was the chief director of the Ministry of Financial Affairs, we were also looking at constitutional review. And the majority leader's position, who is my who's first my minister, the position was that the constitution must undergo a thorough, holistic, root and branch review. That's what it means. And so we have done a lot of consultations with elders of this country, former presidents among others, some you know, justices of the Supreme Court among others. 
university. And in the process, of course, you know, the law faculties and so on, in the process we have had to put in place uh, a consultative committee of some sort of 11 institutions, you know, um, audit service, uh, the National Media Commission, the Judicial Service, but we even have a Supreme Court judge on that committee and they have submitted their preliminary reports, you know, based on the, the consultation that they have done. And it points out that there are a number of uh, inconsistencies, irreconcilable provisions, a lot of great areas that we need to look at. But constitutions are also living documents. It's a reason from time to time we touch base with the original document and see whether we are living by the intent of the framers. It is one thing that is receiving attention at the Labour Ministry. Through our trap attacks, we have met extensive consultations are being done, and some of these provisions we are saying whether or not to join union. I remember we had come from somewhere uh, that if we don't put pets in place and allow people form unions and so on, especially the security services. But now, if we look at it, can we say the security service can now form a union uh, that would seek the welfare of, of their members and so on? So I believe it's an, it's, 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 it's an away review. Uh, eminent people are, are met. Organized labor, you are part. The, the employers are part. The government is part. The consultants leading the process. Lawyers are the attorney general will look at it. They will come to parliament for us to look at it. So be sure that we are taking into consideration how the world of work has better us and how where we are now and the reality. So this is only an information I thought I should let you know. I said that it's slow. And I am sure that lawmaking process, uh, we should also take time so that we don't rush and get uh, somewhere. I want to comment on the involvement of um, civil and public servants in politics because I'm a, more like a public servant because I'm a university lecturer and I have to take a leave to be able to engage in politics. For me, I think that as a country that has gone through over 30 years, three decades of successful democracy. We are a bit more of hope in Africa. And how have we arrived at this? It hasn't been easy, obviously. Everyone knows how the journey has been. But I fear most that what we risk doing is allowing a lot of public and civil servants to go away with experience, knowledge, which is so important for us to even move to the next stage because they are not allowed to involve themselves in politics. Our political era today, or the political space today, is characterized by you have to have strong financial grounds to be able to go into parliament. So if you don't have that, or you don't have the courage and the tenacity to survive the electoral process, does it mean you can't contribute to policy making and to development in your country? So if you are not appointed, or if you don't go to parliament, or you don't have the chance to join the executive, it means you can't contribute. That is where my fear is. That if we don't take care, we grow a generation that only thinks that your ability to contribute has to be because you have money, you have resources, you have tenacity, you have know-how, and then you can enter into the political space. And that's why I strongly believe that if that constitutional provision can be amended, but in quotes, and put into clauses so that at the same time, we protect the civil servant who doesn't belong to the opposition party, but at least can make their contribution in a safe environment for the development of our nation. Otherwise, we get to a stage where we have rare public, civil, civil, public and civil servants who go about 60, 65, they return, and what do they do? They go away with all the knowledge. They would have lost a lot of experience and knowledge. So I believe that for the sake of experience, knowledge, resources, capacity building, and handing over what they have learned, because to have gone through three or four different governments and still be in the civil service, believe me, you are an icon. You are a hope. You possess a lot of knowledge that we still need to keep developing our country. So if there's a way of making some space for people like that to in politics, because that's what controls policy making today. 
I think we should think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 